If doctors told us that we'd made a breakthrough on COVID-19, we would rejoice. We'd feel hope that we could live our lives again, get back to work, back to doing what we want. While masks are a ticket to that freedom. We can help protect others and save lives by covering our noses and mouths, which is how the virus mainly spreads. Until there's a vaccine, grab the breakthrough that's already here. When we're out, it's masks on. A message to help keep you safe. Brought to you by the Ad Council. The original six, a term well known to hockey historians. The Montreal Canadiens, Toronto Maple Leafs, Boston Bruins, New York Rangers, Detroit Red Wings, and Chicago Blackhawks all captured the attention of sports fans throughout North America. Well, I was um, in the record business years ago. A friend of mine and I were having a drink in New York City, and he said, look, I got an extra ticket you know, to the Garden tonight. Uh, the Rangers are playing Montreal, and I said, What's that all about? And he said, well, it, it's the National Hockey League. Would you like to go with me? I said, yeah, I'll go. I said, you know, I didn't have anything else to do that night. So we went to the old garden, and I fell in love with the game instantaneously. It was, without question, the greatest spectator sport I had ever seen. The buildings were full. They'd been full for years and years, and, and the uh, uh, competition in between the six teams was uh, absolutely at its highest. Riding that popularity, the time had come to enlarge the six-team league. I heard that the uh, National Hockey League was expanding from six to 12 teams. I thought that it would be great to apply for a franchise. Ed Snyder, who was working with the Philadelphia Eagles at the time, thought the city of brotherly love would fall for hockey just like he did. But other cities were applying, and Philadelphia's history in hockey was not good. All the other applicants for the six franchises were from cities that had pretty successful minor league hockey operations for, for a number of years. Philadelphia was the only one that hadn't. They had seven or eight minor league teams that, that had failed. There had been one quickly aborted uh, attempt in uh, the 30s to have an NHL team. So there was no uh, history of Philadelphia really being enamored with the sport at all. However, Ed Snyder, along with Bill Putnam and others, persisted. And on February 9th, 1966, their hard work was rewarded. This is the year of the great expansion. For the first time, the league will be composed of 12 teams. Clarence Campbell presided as the teams entered the league. The Philadelphia Flyers, Minnesota North Stars, LA Kings, Pittsburgh Penguins, St. Louis Blues, and the California Seals. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Greetings, sports fans. How are you? Tim Hanlon here, reporting for duty each and every week as we do here on Good Seats Still Available. Yes, the curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Thanks for coming by. Hope you're having a good week. Uh, I can imagine the challenges that uh, you're going through. We're all going through them on various levels, uh, but I'm glad you're uh, taking a few moments to uh, self-care, shall we say, and uh, enjoy a little bit of respite from all of those uh, ills of uh, what's going on in the world around us uh, to revel in some fun memories about uh, some aspect of sports that, uh, for whatever reasons, we've uh, just forgotten. Uh, or has been uh, swept away by history. This week uh, is no exception, and we skate into the uh, wonderful sport of ice hockey once again. And our guest this week, Alan Bass, takes us specifically in the realm of that sport to the great city of brotherly love. Yes, Philadelphia, and we're going to talk about the hockey history of that city. Uh, Of course, perhaps uh, accentuated uh, by that clip that you just heard, from a, uh, we think it's a t- 2007 uh, anniversary uh, documentary slash film commemorating the 40th anniversary of the Philadelphia Flyers. Yes, as you well know by now, uh, longtime listeners to this podcast will know, of course, uh, that the Flyers were part of six, count them, uh, franchises to join the National Hockey League in 1967, the great expansion. Those uh, longest time listeners 
will know that our very first episode on this little show, almost four years ago now, with our old pal Mark Gretschmill, was uh, devoted to uh, one of those six teams, the California Golden Seals. And uh, we had a few other uh, conversations, uh, Steve Courier as well, with his great book about the Seals. Uh, but uh, indeed, until that time, the quote unquote original six, uh, not really actually the original six, and there's some episodes devoted to that too, by all means, check those out, uh, was essentially whatever it was called and known at the time, the 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 hagiography, if you will, of what was the uh, the six teams of the NHL at that time, doubled, literally doubled in size. Dramatic, expansionary thing. And uh, perhaps one of the most uh, successful, longest lasting uh, franchises, and pre- well, I want to say most immediately impactful, but certainly made uh, quite a, uh, a statement uh, fairly early on for a bunch of different reasons. We'll get into the conversation with Alan, were the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, Ed Snyder is the guy you hear quoted in that clip, and he was largely the man responsible. It was his kind of idea. He got uh, the. Uh, the impetus, uh, the uh, the uh, the notion, if you will, to do it by uh, going to see a Bruins game uh, one day. He was at the time working for the Philadelphia Eagles, the NFL, and as you could tell he had some entertainment experience and, and whatnot. And uh, he was uh, bitten by the uh, National Hockey League bug, I guess, at the old garden, uh, watching the Rangers and the Bruins. Uh, and uh, in essence, made it his, uh, his thing to bring the NHL, the top tier, uh, to Philadelphia. Um, but also, as you heard sort of uh, mentioned in that clip, the history of hockey in Philadelphia, uh, I, probably not so negative as that uh, as that little announcer uh, uh, verbiage there kind of uh, maybe suggested. Uh, and Alan Bass is here. Uh, he, the author of Professional Hockey in Philadelphia, a history published by our friends at McFarland to kind of fill in the blanks of the history that preceded the Philadelphia Flyers arrival in 1967, as well as their brand new built from scratch arena called the Spectrum. No longer with us as well either, but uh, certainly part of the story, as we'll hear from Alan in a few moments. But uh, as uh, as he and I will discuss, uh, the history of, uh, of, of hockey in Philadelphia is quite rich. Yes, a lot of it minor league stuff, but uh, there were uh, uh, teams like the Ramblers of the late 50s and the early 60s. Uh, there were the Rockets and the Falcons, uh, which uh, rumbled around the AHL and the uh, then Eastern uh, Amateur Hockey League. There were, of course, well, maybe not, of course, I, it's probably lost on a, mu- a bunch of folks. There actually was an NHL team in Philadelphia before the Flyers. Yes, they were the one-year wonder. I don't know if they were really a wonder. Known as the Quakers from 19, well, the 1930 31 season of the NHL's Quakers, they being relocated from Phil, uh, from Pittsburgh, actually. And we'll talk about that story. But um, uh, suffice to say, they were um, perhaps one of the worst NHL franchises of all time. Let's just uh, leave it at that. We'll get into all the color and the commentary about that in a moment. But it's lost on a lot of hockey fans in Philadelphia to, to, that actually uh, might not know that the NHL actually will have one of its earliest franchises was actually in Philadelphia, albeit for only one year, the Quakers, the lamentable, although cool-looking jerseyed Quakers of Philadelphia. We get into all of that stuff. It's the history of professional hockey, mostly minor league, but also the pros, most, and of course the pros, in Philadelphia with our pal Alan Bass. And yes, we do talk about the Philadelphia Blazers of the WHA. We will not ignore them. Uh, all that coming up in just a few moments time. Before we do so, uh, let's get your uh, holiday shopping uh, done and dusted for uh, as early as we can, shall we? This year, uh, you know that shipping is going to take a little bit longer than normal this year. Lots of things are just not going to be normal this year. But the sports fans in your life are going to be expecting at least some level of gift. And uh, we are here to help you with promo codes galore uh, to make you look like the hero that you uh, ought to be. Uh, with the sports fans in your life. And here we go. Here are the sites that you need to go to. Our great sponsors will have you covered. Uh, and let's let's visit them all now quickly, shall we? Oldschoolshirts.com. Oldschoolshirts.com. Promo code GOODSEATS. 10% off all your purchases there. Thank you to P.F. Wilson. And uh, yes, Old School Shirts got you covered with all kinds of great Philadelphia stuff. Uh, pop culture and the like, but of course, also including things like a, a beautiful Philadelphia Blazers t-shirt. Check it out. OldSchoolShirts.com, promo code GOODSEATS. 
4-17-helmets.com. Thank you, Judd Lesher uh, and uh, his uh, band of uh, folks. Collectible helmets and more. Obviously not hockey, but uh, lots of good Philadelphia memories, uh, like the Philadelphia Bell mini helmet from 1975 of the World Football League. How about the Philadelphia Bell 1974 WFL version mini football helmet, of course. Uh, And yeah, there's even a, a really cool mini throwback baseball helmet. For the Philadelphia Phillies of the 70s. Yes, 417helmets.com. Promo code there, good seats. 10% off all of your purchases. How about 503 Sports? The king of throwbacks. 503-sports.com. Promo code seats. Just seats. The king of throwbacks. 503-sports.com. Seats. 10% off all of your purchases. Courtesy of our pal Dustin Alameda. And yeah, there's a Blazers t-shirt there. Uh, but also really cool. No, it's not a Blazers t-shirt. I lied. I uh, take that back. What there is, is a beautiful, actually in two different versions, Philadelphia Blazers jersey, custom jersey, either in red with yellow trim or yellow with red slash orange trim. Fantastic. Great stuff at 503-sports.com. The king of throwbacks. Promo code SEATS. Don't forget streakersports.com, the purveyor of sports culture. Yes, a Philadelphia Blazers T-shirt there, a great uh, logo and um, graphically uh, uh, overlaid. Uh, It's a black shirt with a yellow uh, emblazoned logo of the Blazers. It's fantastic, as well as lots of other great Philadelphia stuff, as well as lots of great sports culture stuff at streakersports.com. Promo code there is good seats. And you get 15% off all of your purchases there. And last, but certainly not least, our pal Dean. Dean Mitchell, of course, in San Diego. It's sportshistorycollectibles.com. Promo code there is good seats. And the discount for you there is 15% off as well. And that's the place if you truly want to find those one-of-a-kind, hard-to-find sports collectible items. uh, Better, safer, uh, well-photographed than anything you're going to find on eBay. That's the place to go. And Philadelphia stuff, uh, for sure, tons of stuff there, but all kinds of teams and leagues and sports and all that kind of stuff. And in the realm of history and collectibles at that. SportsCenturyCollectibles.com, promo code GOODSEATS, 15% off. And thank you to each and every one of those great sites. And I hope you find some great uh, holiday gift items uh, for those on your sports fan Uh, list. And uh, we thank uh, all of our great sponsors and you for checking them out and hopefully buying a couple of items and, you know, filling our stockings with a couple of uh, nickels and dimes. Keep our little show going. All right, let's uh, keep going with our conversation this week with a a wonderfully uh, well-researched discussion about Philadelphia's professional hockey history. Here he is, Alan Bass and me. Uh, Here's our conversation we had just two weeks back. Thanks for listening. And please, as always, Enjoy. Why don't you give our uh, mightily growing audience uh, a sense of how you, you know, why pro hockey and why Philadelphia and why the the uh, the the interest in digging deep into the, into that story? Like, what's your well, personal story and relationship to to both of those things? So I was born in Philadelphia, grew up uh, just across the river in New Jersey, uh, hence the devotion to Philadelphia, of course. And uh, as far as hockey, you know, like, like many kids, uh, I was introduced to the sport uh, from my dad when I was a little kid. And uh, he took me to a Flyers game and uh, fell in love with the sport instantly. Uh, As I got older, I got into writing a little bit as a side hobby. uh, And of course, merged the two loves together. Um, that's how I started writing for, you know, outlets like the hockey news magazine and whatnot. Uh, and then I just developed a a very deep interest in the history of the game, uh, most of the time at the NHL level. Uh, but then as I started to do a little more research, uh, as I wrote uh, my first book, which was on, uh, NHL expansion in 1967, I got a little bit into the history of hockey in Philadelphia, which went way further back than I had realized at the time. Uh, and as I chatted with friends and colleagues, uh, a lot of them, even some, even some in the media weren't even aware of how far back that went. And I thought, well, if people in the media aren't aware of it and they cover the flyers for a living, this is something that Philadelphia hockey fans are going to want to know about. Uh, for sure I did. And so that's kind of what started the process of research for this book, uh, what eventually became this book. Well, I mean, obviously that's, that's important, right. In this 
sort of conversation, right? Because the Flyers were part of this great expansion in 67. Uh, and I suspect you're, you're uh, around when were you introduced to, to Flyers hockey, like roughly circa? I was introduced. Uh, my, the first game I was brought to was the first season at the then called core state center, which was 1996. I was a little kid and, uh, it was a brand new building. And, uh, that's, that was my introduction to the modern version of the team. And then of course, as I became more of a fan, as I got older, I started learning more about the history of the flyers, the past, you know, all the, all the stories from the six, from the sixties and the seventies, uh, and everything from there. And, you know, just kind of delve deeper and deeper as time progressed. And I'm guessing as you sort of went back, you you came to a hard stop in 1967 with this great this great expansion that as we've gone into in a lot, number of different conversations, especially around uh, the California slash Oakland slash Golden Seals, right, which were part right, of right. the six team uh, extravagance, right, which was, I guess, as you probably discovered, right, um, especially in relation to other pro sports. Uh, almost behind this, the times and or overdue, right? Given the uh, more rapid expansions and or challenger leagues that were sort of popping up around other sports, right? This this was a league, at least until the time, that was, you know, for many, many years, sort of still stuck in their, quote unquote, another story, yeah. original six mode, right? Until the, the tail end of the 60s, which to me, looking back, um, seems just like a big time head scratcher as to why it took so long to recognize that hockey could be much more than just a East and Eastern slash Midwestern kind of thing. And only six teams at that. Absolutely. In fact, one of the running jokes uh, and the time period was that they were called the regional hockey league because they refused to expand past their six teams. Uh, despite the fact that there was great interest from all around the United States, there was interest from other cities in Canada and uh, the owners of the NHL at that point were just very content with their being big fish in a small pond and uh, their revenues were fine. Uh, they pretty much controlled the players, uh, <laughs> as uh, everyone who's done research on, uh, you know, the Players Association history would know. Uh, so, you know, they had a really nice uh, boys club. And it really just was a matter of they had maxed out their revenues. At some point, the league was selling to between 95 and 100% capacity, depending on the metric you, uh, you believe. And they needed a new form of revenue. And so they started reaching out to uh, television network executives and they were pretty much laughed out of the room. You know, the, these executives were saying, well, you guys have nobody in the Bay area in California. You have nobody in Los Angeles. You've got nobody in the middle of the country, say for Detroit. Uh, you know, what, wh why would we be interested in that? And one executive even suggested to them that the Western hockey league had a better chance of getting a TV deal than they did. And it kind of stunned the NHL owners and, and really put them in their place and made them think much deeper about, you know, how do we expand this league? Uh, how do we make it a true national league? And that's where the first conversations, the first serious conversations of expansion uh, really started. I mean, it wasn't until probably 1964, 1965 that the league at least considered doing it. And then of course, everything moved pretty quickly after that. Well, yeah, and the word you're not using is provincial, right? Uh, with with a course. capital P, right? I mean, in terms of the the all boys club and 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 sort of, uh, and look in, in terms of the names, right? Uh, even even after the expansion and stuff, right? Sort of, they weren't sort of geographical, uh, directional uh, definitions, right? There were these, you know, the Smythes and the the Norrises, right? And all these sort of, you right. know, very sort of. Uh, old time, crusty, you know, uh, cigar chomping, the uh, kind of, you know, <laughs> um, but, but I look in 67, right. Obviously you're way too, you know, you were not part of the uh, the picture on this, uh, this great little planet of ours uh, at that time. But, but I, I suspect as you went back and sort of uh, uh, delved into sort of that expansion thing and the reasons, the rationales for it, right. A lot of it being geographical and uh, television and other revenue streams and that kind of stuff. I, I give me a sense of how you sort of discovered or o opened up, shall we say, the Pandora's box of uh, the the history of of hockey in Philadelphia, professional, semi pro, whatever. Before that, because I think a lot of people in today's generation, today's hockey fan, kind of think that Philadelphia kind of just you know uh, it, was, it was sort of a a white hot comet that landed. Uh, with a, a major uh, uh, imprint into the uh, into the Earth's surface there in uh, in Metro Philly in '67, which obviously is not the case. 
Right. And, 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 and let me start on that uh, with you made a comment about the placement of the six new teams in 1967. And one of the interesting things as I did the research for my first book was the reasons behind why each of those teams got placed. And for most of them, it had nothing to do with merit or the ownership group. It, it was very political, as one might expect. Uh, Los Angeles was pretty much guaranteed a team because they had to put a team in Los Angeles to satisfy the network executives. They had to put a team in the Bay Area. That's where Oakland came from. Uh, St. Louis only got a team because uh, one of the big shots in the NHL, and Norris is owned the or the, Norris is in the works is owned the St. Louis Arena, and they wanted to they wanted to get rid of it, uh, but they didn't have a buyer, so they placed a team in St. Louis contingent on whatever owner eventually applied for that team would then purchase the arena from them. So essentially they traded their votes for, for expansion in exchange for guaranteeing that a team would be put in St. Louis. So they had granted a team to St. Louis before there was even a potential owner in sight, which is a pretty big risk on their part in the first place Uh, worked out for them, of course. Uh, And, you know, Philadelphia, for example, they were not supposed to be the last team chosen. Baltimore was really supposed to be the last team chosen along with Pittsburgh to be in the Eastern division or in the Eastern segment of the expansion division. Uh, The only reason they ended up going with Philly is because they were planning to build a brand new arena that was going to hold more seats than Baltimore's arena. And, you know, there's even a quote uh, in the original meetings where Philadelphia was pitching uh, their, their potential uh, hockey franchise to the board of governors uh, you know, one of the guys slammed his hand on the table and said, Philadelphia is a lousy hockey town. You know, why would we want them in our league? And it was that quote that made me think, well, that's interesting because I, I know there was some history of hockey, but if it was so lousy, why would they even take that chance, no matter how big the arena was? And that's kind of what set me on the path towards digging a little deeper into it because, you know, the Ed Snyders and Jerry Wolmans and Bill Putnam's who started the Flyers, they did almost no market research in terms of you know, the success or failures of hockey teams uh, before 1967. And that's a good thing because if they had, they probably wouldn't have taken that risk. So again, it worked out in the end for them and for Philadelphia. But that's kind of what triggered me to say, well, let's look a little deeper at these teams. They couldn't have all been failures. That just doesn't make sense. You know, Philadelphia took to hockey pretty quickly and that doesn't come out of nowhere. And so my desire was to really go back and figure out where the love of hockey came from. It, it, it had to have come from somewhere in the past. And that was really my ultimate goal in writing this current book on the history of professional hockey in Philadelphia to find the start of the game. You know, how, how did, how did, where did the roots come from? How did it first find its way to Philadelphia? And then from there, you know, there were, there were obviously going to be teams that did well and teams that failed. What were the differences between the two? What were the similarities between them? What caused a team to be successful versus not? Was it just wins? Was it something else? That's really where my interest came from. That's where it stemmed from. And that's how I really framed the book. It tells a story about each team uh, in each chapter and really delves into why they succeeded or why they failed, ultimately in telling the story of why Philadelphia is such a big hockey town now. Well, before we dial it back, I want to sort of stick on 67 for a second, because I'm I'm always curious um, about this building uh, called the Spectrum, which uh, uh, I'm wondering, uh, in your investigation of the Flyers being part of the, the Great Expansion, how um, and I think I kind of maybe know the answer to this, but I want to hear it from you more directly. How much of this was the spectrum looking for stuff to fill uh, versus uh, the desire for a hockey team? And oh, conveniently, here's a new arena that we can actually finally get a hockey team into. No, the the building was specifically built for the hockey team. A part of the proposal uh, that the Philadelphia hockey group made to the NHL board of governors was we will build this brand new arena for this hockey team. Uh, so it was, so filling the arena with other events and, you know, the spectrum obviously became one of the, one of the, you know, in, in terms of the number of events it held one of the biggest arenas in the country at that time. I mean, it was way ahead of its time in terms of the number of concerts and the number of various events. I mean, that building was full most nights out of the year, but that was a that was really a, a a side thing. The the hockey team was the main tenant, and it was always going to be the main tenant in the spectrum. It just so happened that you know when you only used it for forty one nights a year, you had three hundred some other nights that you could fill it with, and that's where that other part of the business came from. Uh, so the the spectrum came with the hockey team as as part of the package, and then from there it evolved and developed into what it eventually became. 
So I'm sorry. So and I'm, I'm sorry to be ignorant on Philly sports. So pipe down all you Philly fans. So the 76ers were not necessarily part of the original mix around the arena. They were kind of a second component to this versus the Flyers being the first. Right. And in, the, in building the arena, or at least in planning to build the arena, they understood the potential for it. They understood that the Sixers uh, probably could have used a new home and they might be, a, they might be willing to be uh, tenants in the building. Uh, they understood what the potential was for the building. You know, obviously, when you build an arena that holds you know, 17,000 seats or whatever it was at the time, uh, you have to be able to fill it more than 41 nights a year. So they did have that in the back of, backs of their mind. But the Flyers were the premier tenant in that building. Everything else kind of came just after it. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Cause, and that, 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 I guess that, that sort of makes sense because in essence it becomes, I mean, the, the fact that expansion was, you know, uh, in the mixing bowl, right. Uh, that, that obviously becomes the impetus, right. Where you can start something brand new from, from whole cloth, so to speak, versus just being a, new venue for a currently existing team, which is obviously the case of the Sixers. But yeah, you know, when you're doing market development, of course, and you're looking at, uh, you know, a potential for dates and, and revenue streams and all that kind of stuff, of course, you, you know, you have a ready-made uh, additional franchise in there, but uh, to, to domicile it with the advent of the Flyers or frankly to sweeten it. And, and it sounds like that Philly kind of just got in, to that mixture, um, Snyder being kind of the, the the main stirrer of that drink, right? By the by, the end of it for sure. At the beginning, you know, Snyder was always the one in charge of what was then called Philadelphia Hockey Club Incorporated. Um, he was partners with Jerry Woolman, who owned the Eagles at the time. Uh, was a very famous contractor in the region. Uh, it was building a major project, uh, what eventually became the Hancock Center in Chicago. He, you know, Woolman was well known. He had the he had the fame to help push the project forward. Ed Snyder was in charge of the project from the very beginning. Uh, he had worked with Jerry at the Eagles. Uh, Ed Snyder was instrumental in getting Veteran Stadium built in Philadelphia. Uh, so he had done this before. He had the experience to really get this kind of stuff off the ground. Um, by the end, by the time that the NHL had granted the team to Philadelphia, and by the time that uh, Philadelphia had to pay for the franchise, uh, Jerry Woolman had had left the the group. He had a lot of financial problems stemming from the Hancock uh, project in Chicago. So Ed Snyder really took over that bid along with uh, Bill Putnam, who was the president of the team for many years. Um, and Ed was the one that really put together the financing and, and mortgaged his entire life to make that payment. Uh, in fact, there's a, there's an interesting story or a funny story where, uh, you know, there were the, the Philadelphia group was running around the day of to get their cash together and to get their check together for the NHL. And the NHL kind of had an inkling that there was a chance Philadelphia wasn't going to be able to pay for it. And so they had named Baltimore as the first alternate, um, you know, a long story short. And, you know, I would, I would direct people of course, to the book to read the story in full, but when they finally got the check and they, they, they ran into the, into the uh, hotel to, to give the check to the NHL, the Baltimore group was standing just outside the door with a grin on their face holding their check, fully expecting that they'd have a team by the end of the day. And then the Philadelphia guys handed their check in left and the Flyers officially were born. So it's a, it's, 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 it really came right down to the wire. I mean, there was so much drama in that ownership group in terms of paying for the team, getting the spectrum built. Obviously you had the roof blowing off in that first year. There was so much drama in those first uh, few months in the first couple of years. Uh, and it's a fascinating story to look back on now that we know how the story ends. Uh, it, it really is fascinating and quite hilarious at points. Why do you think Snyder was like so smitten with hockey in the first place if for the arena versus other things or other, I guess he was part of, I, I, if I have this right, he was part of the Eagles organization right at the time, right? Right. He was the vice president of the Eagles. He was essentially running the day-to-day -day of the Eagles while Woman was doing his construction projects. Ed was just a, a, a textbook entrepreneur. He had just extraordinary ambition. He, it was he was just like Jerry Woman. The two had such great ambition. The two had such great visions for what they could do together. Uh, and they were completely willing to take crazy financial risks. Uh, you know, young and dumb kind of thing. You know, they were in their they were in their thirties at the time. So, uh, you know, you know, you, you mess up, you got plenty of years to make it back up. So Ed just liked looking for opportunities and then just going for it. 
uh, just coincidentally in his work with uh, the Eagles, in his work running his record company in, in years before that, which is a whole nother story, he had been introduced to hockey by some colleagues who, you know, had said, you know, let's go to a hockey game tonight. And Ed said, I, I don't know what that means. Sure, let's go to a hockey game. And then he wound up falling in love with the game, like many fans do when they go inside an arena for the first time to see that game. Uh, and so from there, it was always kind of in the back of his mind. Uh, you know, a colleague of his had said to him, you know, I'm moving to LA to work with Jack Kent Cook, who's going to get an NHL franchise. And Ed was like, well, what do you mean an NHL franchise? Are there any available? And he said, yeah, there's, there's six available. And Ed, you know, his light bulb went off and he, and he ran to Jerry Woolman and said, this is a great idea. Why don't we do this? And Jerry said, that's fantastic. Go ahead. Let's do it. Uh, you know, ran into the city, met with the mayor. You know, he, he just, he went gung ho for everything. Uh, that he believed would work. And uh, you see it even later in his life, outside of the Flyers, anything he put his mind to, he went all out. Uh, But at the time, he had nothing to his name. You know, he had to make it work. He had no choice. He mortgaged his entire life to get that team on the ice for the first time. And you see it in the personality. Uh, It's one of the reasons that the Flyers saw such quick success. You know, he he wouldn't allow it to, to happen any other way. How much do you think he and, and, and his group were aware, I guess, or, or tapped into, or, or maybe, maybe there wasn't any, right? I, I guess I'm trying to get into the, the DNA of hockey in the Philadelphia area. And we're going to go, we'll go back a little bit in a minute, but this, from what I understand, this was not the first conversation around the NHL looking at Philadelphia as a market. Um, but I guess I'm, I'm trying to get at, and obviously, you know, the book, you know, goes into the, the history of hockey in Philadelphia. But I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, what was driving that? Was it this, this sort of massive, untapped, you know, hockey culture and, uh, and, and uh, you know, dynamic looking for a, a finally an NHL way to express itself? Or was it more the arena and the convenience and maybe the timing, frankly, of, of this NHL as a as a, as an enterprise, right. More than anything else, than than an, an, an expression of, of hockey finally at the top tier pro level. That's an interesting question. So like you mentioned, there were multiple attempts before 1967 to get an NHL team in Philadelphia, one that succeeded kind of with the Quakers, which I'm sure we'll talk about soon back in the 1930s, but there were other attempts as well. you know, a guy named Len Pito, tried to move uh, the Montreal Maroons to Philadelphia in the 1940s. And, you know, he was promising to build a multi-million dollar arena and he had, he had even gotten approval from the league. And, you know, there, it, it, there were a lot of attempts like that uh, throughout the decades uh, leading in, leading up to the Flyers. All of them pretty much failed for various reasons. Uh, you know, but, but, but what you asked is an interesting question. It's, it's almost impossible to really pinpoint why exactly it was the Flyers attempt that one versus uh, you know, why was that team successful while uh, all the other teams uh, never even got the chance to be frankly. Um, Ed Snyder had this idea that uh, you know, he, he looked at himself as an average guy, which to be fair, he was at the time. He was just some guy working for a football team. Uh, He had, he had almost nothing to his name. Uh, and he looked at himself as just a regular average guy. Uh, you know, he was in his adopted city of Philadelphia, having moved from D.C., and he loved Philadelphia. He he really identified with the people of South Philadelphia. He he, he thought that he was very much like them, and he was. Um, and he had this belief that, well, I'm a regular guy, and I like hockey. Why wouldn't all the other regular guys living in this region? There's no reason why they wouldn't like it too. Uh, and, and it's really, it's almost an overly simplistic viewpoint. Uh, but... Uh, Really, if you think deeper about it, it, it's kind of sheer brilliance and genius to just don't not worry about you know what we would do today, which is market research and and look at the numbers and look at the, and just and just look at the people in the region and say, I know these people. I, I've spoken with them. I've met them. I've hung out with them. There's no reason why they wouldn't like this. I know it. You know, it's 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 a risk, uh, but that's what he did. You know, he he fervently believed. Uh, that he knew what Philadelphia was going to like, and it turned out he was pretty pretty right about that. All right, let's let's talk about before we go back to uh, the let's say the maybe the beginning of this, right? Because I think the um, the Quakers really kind of is, or, you know, I'm sure there's some some pri- primordial ooze even before that, but that's probably yes. a place to sort of finally domicile. But but uh, to, to the extent you can, can you go a little bit deeper into this? Uh, flirtation with uh, the Maroons and them possibly coming to Philadelphia. 
because th- that story in and of itself, and I know that's not sort of your direct focus, but the Maroons were an interesting thing because they were the clearly the number two franchise in Montreal, and and they have basically been sort of dormant for some time, largely because of the depression and the war and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, it's just interesting to me that that would have been uh, perhaps something in the late forties, early fifties, that could have been the NHL in Philadelphia. And, and ironically, the, the first true expansion from the quote unquote original six, uh, you know, before the 67 thing. So um, I, I'm just really curious as to sort of the rustlings of that um, to the extent you've got any sort of knowledge or, or understanding of it. Right. So uh, basically, like you said, the Maroons went dormant in 1938, uh, right around the time of the war. And, you know, like you said, coming out of the great depression and, in the forties, uh, Len Pito, who was, he was on the board of the directors of the Canadian arena company, uh, and had actually worked for the Maroons for some time. Um, he purchased the team promising to construct a two and a half million dollar arena, uh, where the old Baker bowl was in Philadelphia, uh, and then move the team, move the Maroons to Philadelphia, uh, to become the NHL seventh team. Um, essentially, you know, there was a lot of politics involved. There's not really a, a, there's not really a definitive answer of exactly what happened. A lot of this was very secretive at the time, uh, like not in, in, in as much as not even appearing in the NHL Board of Governors minutes. Um, so it was truly on the inside of the Insiders Club. Then how about that? <laughs> so it, essentially, it, it it sounds like there was a lot of pushback from the Philadelphia Rockets, who was an American League team at the time. Uh, they played out of the Philadelphia Arena. Uh, which is a you know, whole another story on its own. But basically, uh, the guy who ran the Philadelphia Arena, Pete Tyrell, he pretty much ran hockey in Philadelphia. He, you know, the Philadelphia Arena was the only place that could remotely house an NHL team, and it was a pretty dank building in the first place. Um, and so any team that wanted to play in Philadelphia pretty much had to go through him. And he pushed back very, very hard with the league. Uh, he pushed back very hard against Pito. He, he you know, he... Tyrell had his connections with the city and he made it very difficult for Pito to, to make his pitch to the city of Philadelphia to get that uh, dream arena built. Uh, and pretty much the process just dragged on for many years. Uh, and at some point it just kind of fizzled out, um, you know, and the NHL pretty much reversed the sale of the Maroons. Uh, and, and the Palestra, which I guess was the only other sort of viable building uh, of size and scale, didn't have ice making uh, capabilities and, and I guess the fact that I guess there was a there there wasn't sort of really for whatever reason any appetite to maybe install such either right and and it would have probably hit the same snags uh, because of Tyrell not wanting competition in the city with his hockey team and so, that's a consistent theme that occurred in the decades before the Flyers of the owners of the Philadelphia Arena trying to prevent other teams from coming in. Interesting. So that's why Pito went sort of the I build a new arena kind of uh, route. But I guess the, ultimately the funding couldn't uh, be uh, cobbled together to, to sort of make that happen. And or I guess he ran out of time because there was a deadline attached to this franchise going somewhere. Right. Pretty much the league kept, you know, giving him leeway, giving him leeway. But at some point they were like, you know, you got to get this done by X date. And then he couldn't get it done. And they terminated the agreement and uh, basically made the Canadian Arena Company return Pito's payment. <laughs> Well, so that's interesting. So obviously, this is not a this is not a conversation devoted to the Maroons, but I guess that will be something that I want to sort of dig into somehow, because in essence, uh, with the failure of that arena and the ability to get the funding for it, uh, that just basically ended the uh, potential re uh, resurrection, I guess, of the Maroons franchise, which is all new and interesting to me. But I, you know, clearly I'm digressing. Uh, as I often do in this uh, on this show, and I, you know, I apologize for that. But so let's let's back up then. Let's talk about these, uh, this team called the Quakers, right? Because um, as we've delved into on a number of other occasions, um, the misnomer of this thing called the original six, right? The Quakers predate this, I don't know, what would you call it? Wallpapered history, I guess, of the NHL. That That's exists- a good way to put it. Yeah, prior to this, what, what, what I think people of a certain age sort of legendarily think is was the, truly the original six, but clearly not the case because there was this thing called the Quakers. How and what were they all about? Because they were part of the NHL prior to, I guess, the culling into to what became the six that lasted for so long. 
Right. Well, the, just for, for the listeners that wouldn't necessarily know, the original six era was from 1942 through 1967. So it wasn't an enormous swatch of the league's history, but of course it's the most well-known when you talk about uh, old, old history in the NHL. But like you said, before 1942, you know, the league existed for decades before that. Uh, the Quakers were actually a relocated franchise. They started as the Pittsburgh Pirates. And when the Pirates owner died, uh, their sons took over and pretty much were not really aware of how to run a team. And they were really struggling. The team was struggling on the ice. They were, uh, they were having financial struggles. They, they were playing some home games on the road to try to draw more fans. It, it was pretty ugly. Um, and essentially, they just wanted to get out of it. And so they sold the team. Uh, and this is where there is some debate. Uh, publicly, they sold the team to Benny Leonard, the famous fighter, uh, but in reality, it appears that uh, Big Bill Dwyer, uh, the mob boss in New York, was actually the owner of the team. Uh, there's some discussion as to was he involved at all? Why did he not uh, announce himself as the owner? Uh, it, it appears that the NHL had made uh, – ha- ha- they didn't so much have a rule, but they had a preference for owners not owning multiple teams. And he had already owned a team in New York, uh, and so he wanted to – control this Pittsburgh franchise without causing a problem with the NHL. So he took Benny Leonard and put him in charge of running the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, you know, they had a lot of problems still, even with Leonard in charge. And so they, uh, they relocated to Philadelphia uh, and it was a planned temporary relocation. Uh, they were, their hope was to move back to Pittsburgh. They were trying to fix up Duquesne gardens, the, the arena they played in or build a new arena. Um, you know, after the stock market crash in 1929, the steel industry was not doing well in Pittsburgh. So there were a lot of issues uh, that contributed to the Pirates not doing well. Enter the Quakers, uh, who say they're going to show up in Philly and play for, you know, a couple of years maybe, and, you know, we'll figure out what to do with it in the long term. Uh, and right from the get-go, it was just, I mean, it was it was pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, uh, they they lost game after game. They struggled to 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 pull any fans into the game, really. I mean, some of these, some of the attendance numbers for the games were horrific. Um, you know, there, there was a, there was a Canadian uh, American hockey league team at the same time, the arrows who were drawing more than this NHL franchise, the Quakers. Um, so, you know, without, without going on and on about it, it was an interesting piece of Philadelphia hockey history because of how, how badly the team failed on the ice and in the box office. And it kind of shows it almost showed a blueprint for what not to do in the future, uh, which is interesting because you see other teams after them succeed and fail based on how they followed or didn't follow the Quakers business model. Uh, You know, ultimately the Quakers only uh, were in Philadelphia for one year and then the team was pretty much shut down. Um, And uh, they still hold the record in the NHL for fewest wins in a season, which is just the record you want in Philadelphia. (laughs) Yeah, well, and, and I think winning percentage, it's uh, among the all-time lowest, although I, I think the, the Capitals in, uh, in the... In right, it's it's second lowest to the Capitals, correct. Yeah, pretty, you know, I think it was, I'm looking at the data here. I think 136 winning percentage for the uh, uh, for the Quakers and then the, the Capitals were at 131 in 74, 75, but still, right. you know, um, and four wins out of, what do they play, 44, right? Um, <laughs> um but I, I guess the question sort of becomes, it was, uh, why Philadelphia, say, versus anywhere else from Pittsburgh? Um, and I guess also, was it, was it more a dynamic around the specifics of this team and, and Leonard and, 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 and the, 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 the dynamics of, of that? Or was this really more of a, depression era story because we're talking about literally the immediate aftermath of a cataclysmic economic event in the United States. Right. So there's not a definitive answer to that question, but it's definitely, uh, it's definitely interesting to discuss. Um, Before they uh, agreed to move the team to Philadelphia, they had looked at other options, including Atlantic city. Uh, And they, there, there's not really Atlantic city, really interesting. Yeah. They, they had looked into it and it was just, it wouldn't work out for them. Apparently not that it worked out much better in Philly. Uh, but they, 
uh, there's not a real answer to why they chose Philly. It's possible it had to do with the distance between Philly and Pittsburgh. You know, obviously Philadelphia is one of the most populous cities in the country, even at that time. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things going for it. And even amidst the depression, the minor league team in Philadelphia was still doing fairly well, all things considering. I mean, they weren't, you know, weren't blowing the doors off of anything in terms of uh, gate receipts, but they were doing fairly well considering that there was a major financial crisis going on at the time. Um, so there was reason for optimism. You know, they, 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 the Philadelphia arena was still fairly new at the time, so it wasn't quite decrepit uh, yet. Uh, but it wasn't a great building. It was it was fine. It was adequate. Um, so there was there were reasons for optimism. Um, but you know the team was terrible on the ice. They showed no fight. Uh, the marketing for the team was not great. Uh, and it's possible that uh, Philadelphia, you know, took offense to the idea that they would just be a pit stop for this team. You know, they had a team, the Arrows, that had been there since 1927 and would continue to remain in that city for for many years. Uh, and they supported the Arrows, uh, who eventually became the Ramblers. They supported both of those teams very well. And then here comes this NHL team uh, saying, here, we're going to stop here for a year, come support us, and then we're going to leave. Uh, you know, Philadelphia isn't that kind of city. That that's, It's definitely something that handicapped them right from the beginning. Do you sense that they could have had a shot if they could have stayed around a little longer? Or, or do you think that the arena was just – uh, you know, part of the problem it was, was never going to sort of cut it longer term. Uh, do you think it was Benny Leonard and his sort of uh, star power maybe fading away, you know, since his, it was at least a decade removed from his, you know, his boxing, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, wins and all that kind of stuff. I was it just the, the money. Uh, was it the lack of discretionary income? I mean, I Atlantic city sounds interesting, but even that would have been probably even more dependent on, the idea of discretionary income because people would be have to travel to get there before they spent their money. Right. Which to me in a 1930 kind of environment, looking back just doesn't seem to be logical given, you know, the economic times. Right. Uh, and, and certainly, I mean, the, the, it's, it's difficult to quantify that completely, but you know, the arrows succeeded, uh, pretty well during that time period and ticket prices were not that much lower than the Quakers. It's not like uh, the Quakers were charging double and triple the prices. They were charging uh, a little bit more because it was an NHL team as opposed to a minor league team. Uh, but, you know, you had a team that did not have much fight at all. You know, it's, it's one thing not to win. It's another to just not be entertaining. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the arena just wasn't made for an NHL team, you know, NHL teams, even at that time, played in, you know, nice arenas for the time. You know, they weren't state-of-the-art by any means. It was still the 1920s and the 1930s. But te- NHL teams at that time played in very large, solid arenas. And the Philadelphia arena was not that at all. It was a minor league arena. Uh, you know, it was already falling apart only a few years after it was built and just got worse as time progressed. Um, but, you know, it, it, I, I, I think a big part of that is how they came into the city. I mean, there's a, there's a great quote in the chapter uh, in the book four, uh, fr- from an author who had written an editorial right after it was announced that the team was moving to Philadelphia. Uh, and basically the way the author phrased it was the national league's head step in, turn over the big league franchise to a group of New York capitalists who pilot a last place club into Philadelphia and tell us to like it, which is a very Philadelphia attitude. You know, that they've got an opportunity to support an NHL team and, their response is almost like, a, oh, "Hey, why, why are you coming in our city like that? You know, the, you're not really one of us, are you?" You know, it's a it's a very Philadelphia attitude, uh, and it probably contributed greatly to people being skeptical about the squad and then not really supporting it too well. But it, but it, it, I okay, it's two questions. Number one, it does it doesn't necessarily speak ill of hockey as a as a uh, as an endeavor, right? Because you're mentioning the Absolutely. arrows, and and I guess the question sort of embedded in that is how much. Uh, did being a quote unquote NHL team matter? Cause it doesn't seem like it did in some respects was, I mean, the NHL, I was it, or was it not, you know, sort of the highest level of hockey. I mean, I'm assuming, you know, you got teams in Boston and Chicago, New York playing in these in Montreal, it's right. Playing in these big arenas, right. Like you're mentioning at the time. Um, I, it sounds pretty darn major league to me at that point. 
but I, does I guess you're I'm wondering if the, the 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 fan and was discerning enough. It sounds like perhaps they were that hey, okay, maybe it's the major league of hockey here in Philadelphia finally, but it's clearly not passing the the smell test when you see how they're how poorly they're competing and and you know we we might as well stick with a team that's at least competitive and and has been around and understands the market a little bit in the arrows despite my I think I think you hit the nail right on the head I mean uh, you know th- there there was clearly uh, a distinction between a national hockey league franchise and everything else uh but that doesn't mean anything if uh, the fans don't feel like there's a commitment to them and to their city. I mean, you know, fan, fans aren't stupid. They can tell when an ownership group is committed to them and not. Uh, and the Quakers were not committed to Philadelphia right from the get-go. Yeah, I think it's also interesting, too, because at the end of that season, uh, they, the Quakers, as well as Ottawa. Was it Ottawa? Yeah, I think um, uh, left the league, right? So it went down from 10 to eight teams. And then you're talking about like Detroit hanging around in Montreal, the second Maroons and the right American stuff. Right. But that's, uh, and that obviously continues to lead towards the further calling down to that or quote unquote original six uh, past all of that. So I, you know, I, I, I can't imagine how uh, easy it must have been or hard. It must've been frankly to run, you know, professional sports at the height of the depression. Right. Um, the fact, I think that the NHL, uh, was able to sort of uh, slim down and hold on for that period of time is is probably a testament to um, maybe the all boys club that that hung on and maybe maybe the partially the reason why it took so long ultimately decades later to finally get out of that sort of uh, six team kind of uh, navel gazing and, and get into sort of the world of expansion and, and bigger uh, geographies. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, again, you hit the nail right on the head there. You're, 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 you're taking my answers right for me. And, and, and that, but that's great. Um, you know, you, you, you've already expressed a wonderful understanding of, uh, of the NHL and Philadelphia hockey at that time. Well, why do you, okay. So then why do you think then <clears throat> having gone all the way back to that and, and having, why do you think it took so long between then and 1967 and this flirtation, I guess, uh, you know, in 39, 40 or so um, to sort of get to that sort of top flight uh, NHL experience again, because it's clear that Philly was uh, pretty robust in terms of being a hockey town, but for whatever reasons, not sort of, because, you know, I just by the, the sheer fact of being uh, a, a relative stone's throw from, you know, some of these major, and long lasting NHL hockey franchises in the Northeast. Um, it would just seem to be natural that it would be almost somewhat inevitable that Philadelphia would qualify both in terms of its market uh, and whatnot to, to be an NHL worthy franchise. I, I just find it so hard to believe it took all the way till the great expansion for it to finally happen. Right. And, and there's gotta, there's going to be a multitude of reasons surrounding that. Uh, one is like we talked about earlier, uh, how, how the Philadelphia Arena pretty much controlled hockey in Philadelphia. They uh, they they had a uh, some really nice pull with the city, uh, but at the same time, you know, we we also talked about the NHL not really being interested in expansion until the '60s. I mean, they there were multiple examples of the NHL expressing an interest in adding teams, including Len Pito's uh, uh, attempt in the 1940s. Uh, you know, the NHL talked with Cleveland in the 40s. Uh, there were a lot of examples of the NHL kind of feigning interest in expansion. But when you look really deeply into it, it looks like those attempts were not really serious. It was almost like an attempt to save face and be like, oh, well, we looked into it, but, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not for us right now. So it, it's kind of both of those together. It was Philadelphia almost uh, pushing back against uh, an NHL team. And it was the NHL just not interested in expanding until the 60s. Uh, before we leave the Quakers, well, um, there were a few names that uh, kind of stuck out, right? It wasn't like, a, obviously, a, a farcical, you know, on, on ice performance. But there were some, some quality names attached to that franchise for that year that, that went on to some great things in the league. Certainly. Uh, Sid Howe, uh, he played his first uh, professional season or his first NHL season with the Quakers. He went on to a Hall of Fame career, certainly not with the Quakers, uh, but he had a phenomenal career. Um, 
You had uh, Wally Kilria, who who played a, a very long time in the NHL. Uh, there, there were some really good players that the Quakers had. They just didn't have the team as a whole. They didn't have they didn't have the right coach. They didn't have the right uh, style. They, they didn't have the support cast. Um, and and to be fair, Sid Howe was very young. He wasn't yet a superstar uh, like he eventually was. Uh, Wilf Kud played a net uh, for them. He would he would uh, bounce around through various Philadelphia teams. Um, but you know, th- at the end of the day, as as we know in any sport, you need more than just a couple good players. Uh, but yeah, we th- there were some there were some good players who got their start with the Quakers and got their start in Philadelphia. And uh, the only other Hall of Famer, I guess, was uh, this Cooper Smeaton guy. Um, was, <laughs> yeah. Um, interestingly, he was the, the, the coach, but he was um, probably more known for being uh, the head referee for the league uh, in its very formative days until, I guess, the, uh, until around this time when he took over as, uh, as coach. I, I, being the sort of referee-in-chief, I guess, for 20 years in this, this league, uh, I, I don't know, it's pretty – Sounds like a kind of unique set of qualifications, perhaps, or maybe not, as evidenced by their performance on the, on the ice, to be a coach. Well, yeah, certainly, like you said, uh, you know, they believed at the time that he was going to bring discipline. You know, he'd roll with an iron fist um, and, and he'd keep everyone in line. Uh, and it turned out that, yeah, he was great at that, but he wasn't a very good coach. Uh, and at the end of the season, he actually went right back to working for the NHL. Um, and that's, that's inevitably how he ended up in the hall of fame with his service to the league, not having anything to do with his time with the Quakers. Well, sorry. So, so explain to me, maybe just sort of in a, in a sort of a, a maybe in a, a, a summary kind of fashion, the, the fits and starts of, of some of the teams on the minor league level, uh, you know, to kind of just that fills in the gaps, I guess, between the NHL flirtation in the, in the late thirties and then the ultimate domiciling of the flyers in 67 um, maybe to give our audience a bit of a sense of you know just the some of the verve and the names of the teams and the you know and, and the uh, I don't know some of the perhaps some of the um, uh, more memorable sort of things that sort of kept hockey going uh, in Philadelphia because it was pretty rich despite its minor league ness no right Right, absolutely. And so we, we had mentioned the Arrows uh, from the Canadian American League. Uh, they started in 1927. Uh, they played through 1935. Uh, and, and pretty much the Arrows franchise, you know, every team that followed them uh, in this line of succession I'm about to go through, uh, there were different teams, but they all kind of uh, went off of one another. So the Arrows played until 1935. And then the New York Rangers decided they wanted to put their farm team in Philadelphia. And so the arena shut down the arrows and then started the Ramblers in 1935 using pretty much the same uh, foundation. Uh, The Ramblers played for six years and then the Rangers shut down that farm team because of the war. So the arena wanted to create their own team again. And that's how you get to the Rockets and the Falcons. And so like, there's this long line of multiple teams that kind of were born from one another. Uh, And the Ramblers uh, in the, uh, in their first year, won the championship of what was then called the International American Hockey League, eventually becoming the American League. Uh, they won the championship their first year, and they were selling out games, and the, the city loved them. I mean, they the, the fans really went for that team, uh, and in fact, they were they they would often uh, they they would boo when they found out that the Rangers were making the playoffs uh, in certain years because uh, the Rangers would take some of their best players, as as most NHL teams did with their farm teams. So as the years progressed, the Ramblers started doing uh, more poorly because they were being, they had a great team that was being gutted by the NHL squad. And so, you know, they'd announce the Rangers score in the arena and the fans would boo because, you know, the Rangers were stealing their, their team's players. Uh, so it was, it, it, you really saw Philadelphia start to fall in love with some of their hockey teams. Um, even yeah, in the sorry, 50s. I mean, that's interesting oh, because it also feels to me like it's a, a bit of a, uh, a more, I don't know, a pre-modern, um, I'm going to call it annexation of the Philadelphia market, uh, whatever you want to call it, by the Rangers, right? It's almost they, it's almost like they had sort of a, I don't know, a, sort of a, an extension, if you will, into that market by means of their of the, their minor league franchise. Absolutely. And, and that was something that NHL teams uh, definitely did throughout that era. Uh, they would have multiple farm teams in various leagues all over the region. Uh, you know, Philadelphia, just to drive up the turnpike, uh, easy to call players up and down, you know, kind of the same reason the Flyers eventually put the Phantoms nearby. Um, so 
uh, you're right. It's, it's a very interesting to see how New York almost gave Philadelphia uh, kind of a stamp of approval from what was a major NHL city at the time. Uh, it, it, it's almost a stamp of approval saying, you know, we recognize that Philadelphia has the potential to be this great hockey market. And that's interesting coming from a city that is now such a rival when it comes to sports. Who else and what else sort of of that? I mean, I, I'm assuming that that kind of hockey was, I don't know, I, a little bit more rough and tumble perhaps than maybe the, uh, if you call the NHL refined at the time. <laughs> yes, certainly. I mean, minor hockey. And in fact, if you even jump to the, the second edition of the Ramblers, which was the Eastern Hockey League uh, in the 1950s, uh, you know, the Eastern Hockey League was the league that spawned the Slapshot movies. So uh, you see, you know, hockey had always been rough and tumble. There are always fights. There are always brawls. Uh, but once you get to the Eastern League, you really start to see uh, that, you know, stereotypical, you know, I went to a, I went to a fight and a hockey game broke out kind of uh, mantra. And the Ramblers, uh, you know, they did okay. They actually had the longest tenure of any team before them, nine years, uh, you know, very, they had a very sad ending where they, dec- where they went into bankruptcy and shut down suddenly. Uh, but that team, even today, still has such a cult following. The fans, they didn't sell out the building very much, but the fans that showed up were diehard. They were so supportive. They would travel to, to, to watch the team on the road. And, I mean, even today, you go, you go into forums, you go into Facebook groups, and people love the EHL. People love the Ramblers. You still see people, you know, sharing ticket stubs and saying, you know, I was at this Ramblers game in 1962. In fact, Lou Nolan, who is the PA announcer for the Flyers and has been since 19, uh, I believe 1967, uh, he got his start in hockey by going to Ramblers games as a kid. You know, he, 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 uh, you know, I chatted with him uh, at, at length just casually about his memories of the Philadelphia arena and, 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 uh, watching some of his favorite players in the Eastern League at the time, so it was it was one of those leagues that really helped spawn uh, some really uh, devoted fandom to hockey in Philadelphia, uh, and it really you know they, they folded just a couple of years before they announced uh, that Philadelphia was going to get an NHL team in 1966. Yeah, that, that's uh, interesting. I wanted to get into that because go on. Uh, why why that gap? Um, was it because the 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 uh, uh, the mechanics of getting the Flyers into the league was underway, or or was it just a, sort of a folly or a a chance, sorry, of time that the that for whatever reasons the Ramblers couldn't hang on until then? Because a three year gap and then this new NHL thing, I, I you know, um, I, I got to think if you were a hockey fan in Philadelphia, you were kind of like, you know, uh, w- what's happening here. Absolutely. And, and it's more just a matter of the timing. In fact, when the Ramblers shut down very suddenly, um, pretty much the, they, they had not made their escrow payment to the league. Uh, and the league just announced that we're suspending the, the Ramblers franchise. And there was kind of a, an internal battle with the ownership group. And then they just went into bankruptcy and folded. It was very sudden. No one really knows the full story of what happened. It's kind of lost to history. Um, but when they folded in 1964, there was not even an inkling that the NHL was going to expand. That didn't get announced until 1965. So it was just a matter of chance that you had that gap and that the Flyers just coincidentally followed the end of the Ramblers. It just kind of worked out. So wouldn't Snyder then, even with the, the idea of, of, of a building and, 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 and all of that, wouldn't that give you a pause that, you know, maybe hockey isn't the right thing to maybe sort of push in this market? because of what the happened to the Rockets and excuse me, the Ramblers and, and well, the Rockets too. And just, you know, and I don't know, it would give me pause, right. That, you know, well, I, there's not a fledgling minor league team here. Um, why would I want to take a chance after, you know, with a gap or two, or did he see around a corner somehow that maybe given the NHL treatment, the hockey could indeed succeed perhaps with the new building, et cetera. I'm not even sure he looked that deeply into it. Um, I, to my knowledge, I don't believe he ever attended a Ramblers game. I don't believe he ever attended any hockey game in Philadelphia. Um, I believe he had an understanding that there was a hockey team, but past that, I'm not certain he knew anything past uh, any, anything more. Yeah, that, uh, and that's interesting. that might've been a good thing. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> because you, you think that you'd want to somehow market test or market, see how successful or passionate a, a, a hockey fan base might be in the market before you'd, you know, really go out on a limb and, you know, build a building and get a new NHL expansion franchise. And when he, and when he was older, actually looking back on, uh, on his, 
on his career, he made a comment that, you know, if we had done market research back then that we do now, we would never have started the Flyers because we would have seen some of the history and, and said, oh, this isn't worth the risk. And so it's fortunate that he didn't really look into it because he never, I mean, Philadelphia probably would have gotten a team eventually, uh, but it surely wouldn't have been the Flyers and it wouldn't have been him. Oh, the classic case of not knowing what you don't know, right? I guess. And, and exactly. And sometimes and, it works out. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think yeah, sometimes there are, I know there are a lot of performers, for example, sort of take that sort of like, I didn't know any better. I just was doing it and was doing my best at it. And, um, you know, I didn't know I should have been doing this, but that's why I did it. And it wound up becoming a success. All right, let's round the corner here. So uh, I, I cannot let this conversation go uh, without uh, talking about, the World Hockey Association, and the Blazers. Uh, and frankly, as I emailed to you as well, the, uh, I guess the, the, the dalliance uh, across, the, uh, across the river there to uh, the Jersey Knights uh, as well, being sort of in the Philadelphia area. I, 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 let's put it this way. I, I, um, I wonder, uh, given the relatively... I wouldn't call it checkered. I, I guess it was fairly strong history. And well, maybe the relative uh, newness of the Philadelphia Flyers, right, in the market. Um, why would the WHA look at Philadelphia being somewhat of a, I don't know, somewhat still early and fragile NHL market as being, quote unquote, ripe for a World Hockey Association challenger um, especially given the fact that the Flyers were in this relatively new and state-of-the-art building uh, that the Blazers, I'm guessing, didn't even have a prayer to sort of domicile themselves in. So the WHA did not look at, well, I shouldn't say they did not look at Philadelphia. They didn't choose Philadelphia. Uh, the Blazers started in Miami. Uh, they, were, they were awarded, uh, Miami was awarded a WHA franchise. Um, the the and then, Eagles franchise? Right. And then when uh, they were unable to get their arena built and there were financial issues, they sold the team to uh, Jim Cooper and Bernie Brown uh, in, in the South Jersey region. And they relocated the team to Philadelphia and made a deal with the city to play at the what was then what was called the Convention Hall and Civic Center. They, they basically re-outfitted the inside of the Civic Center with an ice rink uh, and paid and paid a, a large amount of money to do so uh, so that the Blazers could be there. Uh, and and in, in in answer to your, to the other part of your question about why Philadelphia was ripe for a World Hockey Association team, I'm not so certain it was per se, and that would be uh, that would be provable by seeing how terribly the Blazers did in their one year in town. Uh, but at the time, it was 1972, uh, and at the time, the Flyers were an up and coming but really underperforming team. They'd made the playoffs a couple of years, never got past the first round, and they had they had blown a, a division lead late in one of the seasons and missed the playoffs in the last day. And and so there was a segment of Philadelphia who was really ready to love hockey, but were getting frustrated with the Flyers. Uh, they weren't yet winners. They were not winning Stanley Cups yet. They were on the verge, uh, but they weren't yet there. So the feeling towards the Flyers was skeptical and hopeful and disappointed and so it, it did uh, create some semblance of room for another team, but I'm not sure the World Hockey Association was the right choice, especially with how they eventually ended up spending money on on, on players. Um, but it but it does create an interesting uh, segment of the market. Uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, can Philadelphia handle two major league teams just a few years after the Flyers started? Sure enough, the answer was no. But you wouldn't have been able to guess that at the start. Yeah, well, you want to talk about the start, their first ever game? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Yeah, they uh, they uh, went out to uh, do warm ups, and uh, you know something. The ice seemed a little echoey, and you could kind of feel it uh, being hollow underneath, and uh, sand was piling up. Can you give a little bit of background of what the Civic Center was in relation to, say, something like the Spectrum, right? Because the Civic Center was sure. It was a convention center. Yeah. It was not a it was not a sports arena. They tried to outfit it to be a sports arena, and so uh, you know, ice making was not nearly as modern in 1972 as it is now, and surely not in a building that's not meant to handle an ice rink. Um, so you know, the, the sand piling up in the corners and the ice sounding hollow, and uh, you know, Derek Sanderson, who uh, you know was the big pickup for the Blazers uh, from Bo- out of the Boston Bruins organization, 
he goes up to the ref and says, you know, I'm not sure this is safe to play on. And the ref, you know, he's, he's sweating bullets and he's nervous. And he says, we can't cancel the game. It's opening night. You know, we're gonna have to refund everybody all the, we can't do that. You know, we got to play the game. You know, this is a brand new league. Everyone's counting on us. Um, so they say, all right, they go to the locker room. And while they're in the locker room, they hear a very loud crash and they run out and they see that the Zamboni has fallen through the ice, uh, cut a huge hole in the ice. And pretty much they had to cancel the game and give everyone their money back. And, Sure enough, the uh, souvenir orange pucks that they had given out to everyone when they walked in the building ended up being thrown at the players uh, on the ice in, uh, as, as is Philadelphia fashion. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm pre, 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 uh, presaging the, uh, the, uh, the love affair with uh, Santa Claus at the old veteran stadium. Oh, but of course. Uh, but, so, but, I mean, you could not have picked a more ignominious uh, uh, debut, right? Um, and I, I, that just set the tone, I guess. Um, I, how do you th- how, so i mean i obviously we, we've talked about the wha with uh, uh with dennis murphy of all people right the founder still with us at, at 90 right. years old i think he is um, <laughs> I, I i'm just really curious as to how they figured out a way to try to keep themselves competitive and and uh, marketing against uh the flyers albeit not necessarily lighting it up themselves but at least you know uh in a state-of-the-art arena and, and the, uh, the, you know, the NHL being uh, the legacy league and all that kind of stuff. I, I just wonder how, how they went about marketing themselves as, a, as an alternative to that and or the folly of that to, uh, to, to, to even try. So they, they utilized their marketing scheme pretty much in direct competition with the Flyers intentionally. Uh, they, they tried to ride the wave of skepticism towards the Flyers. Uh, you know, they took a lot of veiled shots at the Flyers, a lot of, uh, of not veiled shots, a lot of just very straightforward shots. They, they made comments about, uh, you know, people often had to wait, wait outside in the rain in line at the Spectrum to get tickets because the box office wasn't covered. And so they made little shot, they took little shots at the Flyers saying, well, our building, you can wait inside. It's nice and warm kind of thing. Uh, and it, you know, like they did a lot of things like that. They, they lobbed a challenge across the city to say, let's have our two teams play and see who's better. And of course the Flyers knew better than to engage in that because it's a, that's a no win situation right there. Um, and so the Blazers really tried to position, position themselves as the alternative to the Flyers. Um, but you know, that's really hard to do when the Flyers had Bobby Clark, they had, you know, they were really, they were starting to come into their own. Uh, and the Blazers had a, uh, less than nice hockey arena to say the least. And, uh, they, you know, they had some big names on their squad, but they weren't a great team at the beginning. It took them a couple months really to get into it. I mean, Derek Sanderson was the big name, uh, but in the NHL, Derek Sanderson wasn't, you know, a high powered first line scoring forward. He was, he was a, a very big personality, and in the WHA, he was certainly going to be one of the best offensive players. Uh, but the WHA was surely a step down from the NHL, uh, and so they had their work cut out for them. Um, they did have Andre Lacroix, who wound up leading the league in scoring in that one year. Uh, he was a dynamic personality and a dynamic scorer. Um, but, you know, it's, it's tough to position yourself in direct competition with an, with an NHL squad and then not perform as well as that NHL squad. <laughs> well, they also had Bernie Parent, right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and I completely, completely forgot to mention him. Absolutely. They, well, they, so uh, it's some names that at least get them some level of, if you will, curiosity and credibility, right? To, to at least be worth a look to, you know, buy a couple. Oh, for sure. Check them out. Yeah, right? and Ber- Bernie had signed with Miami. Uh, and then when, when uh, they moved the team to Philadelphia, he agreed to play for Philadelphia. Uh, and he had some sore, he had some sore feelings towards uh, the Flyers because they had traded him to Toronto. And he, you know, when, when he was told that he was being traded to the Maple Leafs, he, I mean, he cried. He was so distraught that they would move him because he loved Philadelphia, you know, an original expansion draft pick. Uh, and he had some hard feelings towards Philadelphia. There were some nasty things he said about the Flyers at that time in the press. And which of course later, you know, you know, water under the bridge, especially after you win two Stanley Cups for the Flyers. Um, but at the time, you know, he was really, he was really uh, hurt from the Flyers having moved him. Uh, and he was happy to be in competition with the Flyers. And, and that really added to the drama and added to the positioning that the Blazers uh, put themselves in. That's interesting. So, so how did it all end? I mean, it, it, uh, it obviously it didn't start well after being hastily relocated from Miami where they really never got a chance to play, but you know, talk about, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're pulling out the map and trying to look at uh, 
where you're going to relocate this franchise. You, you, I don't know. You spin the dial and, and, and I, I don't know. I, I'm not quite sure I would have imagined where they wound up uh, at the end of the season. And maybe, maybe you have some insight as to like how and why that happened. Right. And, and this, the season was uh, looking up at one point, you know, they, they barely made the playoffs at the end of the season, but they were playing really well. Uh, you know, they had a terrible first few months uh, and, and they're really, their, their dynamic end to the season really just got them into the playoffs and they were looking great. And then Bernie Perron actually walked out on the team and there's a dispute as to what exactly happened. Um, you know, at, at the time, Bernie and his agent claimed that they were owed money, that they weren't paid. And of course the owners of the Blazers said that's absolutely not true. And, uh, you know, it's still disputed to this day because Bernie doesn't want to talk about it. And understandably, so it was a really painful time for him in his life. Um, but the, you know, it, it really, it forced the team to put an unproven goalie in net. They wound up losing very quickly in the playoffs and it was a really disappointing end to what could have been a good season. And then almost out of nowhere, the team was sold to Vancouver and, and it was gone just like that. You know, it was, it was, it was in the newspapers before the employees even knew they were getting calls. They were coming into work and getting calls from people saying, has the team been sold? And they had no idea. They said, no, we're still here. And then sure enough, the rumors proved, uh, proved out, proved to be true. Uh, and the team was gone just like that. Okay, so and they didn't—they never really drew well, right? No, not really. <laughs> okay, so then, and I know your book doesn't t- touch on this, but the metropolitan area encompasses South Jersey, right? And right. I guess I'm just really curious, based on what you could sort of put together, or, or uh, assuming you've got some knowledge or some understanding, or maybe even have just an educated guess, why then, in all their wisdom, <laughs> would the WHA think that? Given the uh, the situation that was going on in New York, which was the Golden Blades uh, essentially having a falling out with the, the Madison Square Garden folks and stuff, why would they look at suburban Philadelphia to relocate that team as the Jersey Knights, given what had just happened across the river with their WHA franchise in Philadelphia proper? Doesn't seem <laughs> that is. Oh, that is a fantastic question. It's not was not sort of the pinnacle of logical of logic. Yeah, that's that's certainly true, and that's a great question that I do not know the answer to. In fact, that probably would have been a great question for Dennis Murphy. <laughs> yeah, well, we're we're hoping we get him again at some point uh, soon because there's a lot of other things we want to talk to him about for sure, including that. But um, yeah, I just it's interesting. I, I, I guess there's a couple of things. Number one, it speaks at least to the fact that Philadelphia feels like a strong hockey market, or at least worth the shot, right? But at the right. same time, it seems almost counterintuitive given the relative debacle that that, that was the Blazers that year prior. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, th- I think you said it perfectly right there. All right. Well, let's um, uh, let's just sort of sort of round all this up. Then what, describe to me then what what you feel sort of the um, uh, the dynamic of, of hockey since then, because f- obviously the Flyers have done quite well for themselves. Thank you uh, on a number of different levels. Right? You know, maybe not racking up a ton of Stanley cup championships, uh, you know, and, 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 and you know, uh, but, but so obviously a, a, a very dynamic and, and longstanding part of the Philadelphia sports culture. I mean, obviously the Broadway bullies and, and all that stuff, right. I mean, they, they've really cemented their, uh, their uh, legitimacy, if you will, in the Philadelphia sports realm, but it's interesting how it's not sort of uh, fended off uh, minor league hockey competition uh, over the years since, right? It's almost like to me, like here in Chicago, right? The Chicago Wolves, uh, you know, filling in the gaps when the Blackhawks uh, were sort of in their uh, in their waning periods of time um, became a pretty strong and dynamic alternative, especially to the suburban crowd uh, for the hockey dollar in Chicago. Um, I, it seems to me that Philadelphia is another great example of, hey, the market's big enough to support an alternative minor league franchise, despite having a very successful, uh, relatively, Flyers franchise in the NHL. It's not, it's not common, is it? Uh, no, and, and certainly, and, and when you talk about successful, obviously you, you can talk about it from two different ways. If you're looking strictly at Stanley Cups, yeah, you can, you can argue all, all day about that. But from a financial perspective and from a market perspective, the Flyers have been one of the most successful teams in the NHL since 1967. I mean, they've they've consistently sold out that building um, almost year after year um, up, up through the last few years. Uh, but in terms of minor hockey, yeah, you had two uh, pretty serious minor hockey franchises 
in Philadelphia after the Flyers were already there. You had the Firebirds uh, run for uh, about six years in the city in the 70s. And then you had the Phantoms run for about 13 years in the city from, ni- from 1996 to 2009. And, uh, you know, both of them had different levels of success. The Firebirds were pretty successful, ultimately relocated to Syracuse. And the Phantoms were perhaps the most successful American League franchise of their 13 years. I mean, they, they, they really helped prop the AHL up at a time when they were battling for minor league supremacy with the International League. Um, so it was, it, it's interesting to see like you said, the, the, that Philadelphia could support two different teams, uh, a major and a minor league team. And one of the reasons is because the two don't really compete with one another, at least in the modern uh, hockey market. Uh, you know, back in the 1930s, it was much different. But in, in the 70s, you know, a minor league team uh, was a ticket for a minor league team was much cheaper than an NHL team. And for sure, in the 90s, when the fandoms came about, you know, I think at the time, Flyers tickets were maybe like $40, $50 for a lower level seat. And a Phantoms ticket was $5. So you're not competing for the same consumer at that point. So from a business perspective, it does make sense in a hockey mad market to, to, to put a minor league team to support the major league team. It really helps generate the next generation of fans who, at least in the 70s with the Firebirds, could not even get a ticket to the Flyers because they were winning Stanley Cups and sold out every night. And in the 90s, may not have been able to afford Flyers tickets necessarily. Uh, and so it really creates an opportunity for families, young kids, to see a hockey game in a way that doesn't break the bank. It maybe costs uh, you know, $30, $40 for a family afford to see a game uh, for the Phantoms, let's say, in the 90s, whereas it costs hundreds of dollars to see a Flyers game for a family of four. And so it, it, you see from a business perspective how it makes sense, especially in a market as big as Philadelphia. Yeah, sure. I, that makes sense. And, and, um, uh, but I, it's also interesting that the dynamic though is a little different than say here in Chicago, right? So the, the wolves, right. Be, were, became, uh, more of a suburban lower cost fun filled minor league, heavily promotional, uh, dynamic versus the in city big market, if you will, uh, black Hawk thing the, the, the geography and the stadium situation in Philadelphia, quite different, right? Absolutely. You've got what's called the sports complex in Philadelphia. And it's, it's funny because when I was a kid, I never understood that that was unusual, that a city put all of their sports stadiums in the same little area. I would go to other, other cities and, you know, you'd go to New York and Madison Square Garden was in the middle of Manhattan and Yankee Stadium was over in the east. And I, you know, I didn't understand why you wouldn't put all the stadiums together. And I never understood that Philadelphia was unique to that. And so people outside Philadelphia may not realize that, you know, at one point there were five major stadiums in the Philadelphia sports complex. You had the Eagle Stadium, the Philly Stadium, you had Veterans Stadium, uh, you had the Spectrum, you had uh, the, the, the Core States or Wachovia or Wells Fargo Center. Um, you know, at this point now you're, you're down to, uh, to three stadiums. Uh, but it was all in this little complex and the spectrum was where the Phantoms, uh, played was literally across the parking lot from where the Flyers played. So when they called a guy up or sent him down, they would literally send him across the parking lot. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very funny because like you said, in, in other cities, you put the minor league team in a suburban area. I mean, you even look at, uh, the, the Vegas Golden Knights, they're putting their new team and out in Henderson, which makes perfect sense. Uh, Philadelphia said, no, 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 we're going to put it right next door to the Flyers. Uh, and it's watch, it's not going to be a problem. And sure enough, they sold out every, uh, almost every Phantoms game for years. All right. So, so two questions on that, on that, that front, and we'll, we'll hopefully let you go at some point. Um, the spectrum then at that point in the nineties uh, with the Phantoms is 96 through, I guess the, t- through pretty much the, uh, the aughts, right. Um, the spectrum was essentially once the, Wachovia now, or core states, or whatever it was called at the time, uh, <laughs> was was um, basically the uh, the little baby sister, if you will, uh, arena. I'm just I'm I guess the question is why 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 would they keep that arena next door, uh, a, a, especially since it was part of that you know co- relatively com- uh, com- compact he says sports complex uh, versus just you know, demolishing it and then letting all of the, of the new arena take all of its, uh, all of its glory. So so like, there's this, a, I guess. Well, so there's a couple points to that. The first is that there was actually enough demand for all of the shows and concerts and events 
they had room with the, they had enough demand to keep two buildings, frankly. Um, so obviously they put all of the main events in, in, uh, the center, uh, you know, the 40, 41 flyers games, 41 Sixers games, um, you know, Disney on ice and all, all of the major things that, uh, that showed up in Philadelphia every year, but the spectrum, you know, the circus came to town every year, uh, concerts every year, you know, there, there's, there's certain bands that, you know, almost called the spectrum a home that were, they were there so often, you know, Bruce Springsteen played there all the time. Uh, and so there was, there was enough demand. There were enough events that warranted keeping both buildings open. Um, that's part of where the fandoms came from. They wanted one major tenant that they could count on for 40 games a year. Um, you know, they tried some other minor, uh, minor sports like the kicks that uh, they eventually put the Philadelphia soul in there. You know, there were a lot of different teams that, uh, tried, uh, that tried to, uh, to make it work in the spectrum, but the phantoms were the main tenant, just like the flyers were back in the day. The other side of it was, uh, you know, try, try going into, try being the one to go into Ed Snyder's office, uh, with that famous, uh, scowl he always had and that glare he would always give and tell him that you want to tear down his baby in 1996 no one was going to do that. So instead they found a good use for the spectrum for many years until pretty much the point where the, the building was just physically falling apart and they couldn't repair it anymore. But this was, uh, and to sort of round it up, this was, this was a flyers led minor league uh, franchise and relationship, right? Both in terms of affiliation as well as co-ownership and or real estate and all that stuff. Everything, yes. So at that point in 1996 is when Comcast uh, partnered with Ed Snyder and purchased a majority of the team. Comcast is the one that applied for the Phantoms franchise. So it was held under the same Comcast Spectacore umbrella that still runs the Flyers. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, so to me, that's a very unique sort of a, a, a coda, I guess, to the story. Because here, here we are, we, we're talking about sort of the Flyers, which is kind of the beginning of our conversation, right? Which... Uh, not only has gone on to success and becoming sort of one of the you know standout franchises in, in, in the NHL of the modern day for sure. Um, here they are, you know, from a business perspective, right? Uh, from an arena perspective, from uh, an, a minor league affiliation perspective, a, a broadening of the market, right? The family market, so to speak, that can't afford. So the, that's um, ironically, you'd think that that would be, yeah, and, and that being directly across the street, literally and figuratively. Uh, is a pretty unique situation and uh, and all part of, I guess, the sort of uh, the hockey history, uh, which I think is unique to Philadelphia, which, you know, um, I'm not sure the average fan, maybe even Philadelphia fully understands. Yeah. And it really from a business, uh, the Phantoms chapter really does focus on the business side of it um, just because, you know, the history has been told very well. And so, you know, you touch on the on ice history, but the business part of it is actually what's fascinating to me, at least in that, you have, like you said, you have a major league franchise running a minor league team, which was unusual for the time and still unusual now. Um, but it really benefited uh, the Phantoms and the AHL at, at a time when the AHL was looking for to put more teams in major cities. Um, they really were a small, a small market league at the time, and they were trying to get into places like Philadelphia and trying to get into uh, major cities around the country. Uh, so when you had the Flyers, who you know at the time they had various uh, subsidiary companies. Uh, they had, you know, a ticketing company, they had a marketing company, they had an arena management company, they had a food concession company. It was a massive corporation at the time that Comcast took it over. Um, and basically, you know, for example, it gives you the opportunity to, to, to double dip on everything from a business perspective. So if let's say Pepsi calls the flyers and says, we want to do a sponsorship and have our logo at center ice at the center, you can say, absolutely, let's talk about that. But as part of the agreement, we'd also like you to sponsor our minor league franchise and put your logo at their center ice as well. So there's a way where you can share a lot of the uh, business opportunities between the two teams. Uh, and of course, you use the resources that the Flyers have uh, and that the center has and the Spectrum has in order to you know, really ratchet up the revenue. I mean, the, the Phantoms right out of the gate were exorbitantly successful, uh, both on the ice and in the box office. I mean, they sold out games like crazy. I mean, people were lined outside the building to get tickets to games sometimes. And, you, you know, would it have succeeded without the Flyers owning it? Possibly. It, it probably would have been pretty successful. But with the Flyers owning it, it just kind of was a grand slam. Like, there was no doubt that it was going to succeed. Uh, and, it, and, you know, it, it's a shame because the only reason they ended up moving was because they had to knock down the spectrum. Uh, you know, who knows how long the Phantoms would have stayed there. Um, but basically the spectrum by 2009 had reached the end of its useful life. And they had a choice of putting, you know, 
20, $30 million to, to gut out the inside and rebuild it, which was just not worth it to house a minor league franchise. And so the decision ultimately was to knock it down and sell the fandoms to someone who would eventually house it in Allentown, which by the way, is working out phenomenally. If any, if any of the fans in Philadelphia have not been to that building, uh, once fans are back allowed at, uh, at games, uh, that, that complex and that region is just remarkable what the fandoms have done up there. Oh, and that's and that's obviously good for geographical, uh, uh, you know, ownership of and 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 uh, uh, sort of broadening the base, so to speak, right? For sure, um, that's uh, more sort of marketing genius, I guess, that uh, the Flyers have been able to kind of leverage over the years. All right, uh, one more quick question, and then I'll let you promote, and then uh, I'll let you finally get on with your life here. Um, calling back the Quakers for a second, um, I, I, I we try to sort of delve into this on a lot of other converse, uh, conversations and, and explorations on this little show. Where does that history, that one year history, uh, oddly that you know uh, maybe many would like to forget, uh, has there ever been a callback to that by the Flyers uh, domiciling uh, or, or recognizing that history, if you will, at least the sweaters, which were pretty cool looking. Uh, or has it just been a complete wallpapering of it and or ignorance of it? And then frankly, who cares? No, the Flyers really have never touched on any of the pre-Flyers hockey history in the city. There was that rumored jersey for the Winter Classic that used the Quakers jersey as the base for it. That never really, uh, they never wound up using it, but you can find some knockoff ones online, of course. Uh, and they look pretty cool, to be honest. Um, but it was actually the Phantoms who... Uh, paid paid homage to some some hockey history, uh, both in Philadelphia and uh, around the hockey world. Uh, they would do what's called turn back the clock nights, uh, where the team would wear an old jersey, whether it was an old Philadelphia jersey. Uh, they they did the Flynn Flon Bombers one night because that's where Bobby Clark played his junior hockey. Uh, you know they they regularly paid hom- paid homage to the uh, uh, to the history of the game, and that's something that's very very normal amongst minor league hockey. Uh, you know, they, they really take the history of the game very seriously. Whereas, you know, NHL teams, they take their history seriously, uh, but it's different. You know, you're going to a major league arena, you're going to a major league game. It's much, much more serious. Uh, you know, it's a much bigger deal, of course. Um, and so you may not even expect an NHL team to delve that far back into the history. Well, no, um, but it, it's def- it doesn't have any direct money sort of uh, connection to certainly, it. Right? Certainly, certainly. Get- but, but at the same time, you still want to see that history honored in some way, shape or form. Um, and that's what I hope the book can do really. Yeah, no, and I, I agree. And I, I just, I, you think that, um, you know, I, 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 look, I don't think anybody wants to dial it back to the Quakers and, and talk about how they only won four out of 44 games <laughs> that one year of their brief existence, right? But, um, I, you know, if you're, if you're smart and you're creative about it, you can think about it as, hey, it's a, it's a callback to uh, Philadelphia being truly an original hockey city and being one of the first in the NHL's, well, history, really, I guess, as it was, you know, it, it, there's something there to it, right? And plus, it's got a cool sort of creative thing that could be merchandisable with that sweater and that logo, right? So, I don't know, we, we kind of, I, I, it's very interesting to see how, um, how history for current teams uh, and callbacks and stuff and heritage, uh, it, it seems to be a matter of convenience more than anything else. Like, when it's convenient to make a buck, uh, they'll do it, right? Like the Carolina Hurricanes, you know, conveniently remembering that the Hartford Whalers were, you know, uh, became before them, right? And, you know, and the Hart- people in Hartford actually getting a little excited and or also upset at the same time that it's being done sort of on that and, and where those revenues go, right? Um, it's just the convenience of it sort of is just very interesting. But that history is there, right? And you're mentioning the, the minor league stuff too, you know, there was, there's that hockey history that came in between those two NHL tent poles, if you will. Um, it, there's probably money to be made there, so to speak, uh, which is not maybe the, the, the best reason. But the history in between at the minor league levels and the fans that grew up and, and kind of kept that flame going uh, until the Flyers came in 67. And then, you know, and then with the Phantoms, uh, there's, there's a hockey history there, right, that you're, you're touching on, that your book speaks to. Um, you'd think that uh, some sage, uh, you know, folks in the organization might want to, you know, go through the books a little bit and maybe, you know, kind of unearth some of that. Um, maybe there's a few dollars to be made along the way. Okay, so be it, Lucky Strike Extra. But there's a history there that, um, and that heritage, God forbid, could actually be resuscitated, remembered, and, um, 
you know, uh, and just uh, put into people's minds as they uh, uh, understand what hockey is all about uh, in the Philadelphia area. You know, that would be fantastic. And if we're both lucky, someone high up at Comcast Spectacore is listening. And if they want to put a little section at the center, uh, giving, giving honor to the history of uh, hockey in Philadelphia, I would be the first in line to buy a ticket. All right. Well, let's give them the uh, specific excuse. Why don't you promote the book and uh, tell uh, the audience uh, what it is specifically, what's included in it, and maybe what else you got up your sleeve, perhaps in your, uh, your writing endeavors after this book that uh, just came out, right? It came out uh, about a month ago, yes. It is called uh, Professional Hockey in Philadelphia, A History. Uh, and essentially, each chapter uh, focuses on a different team that played in Philadelphia from the time that the game's roots were first uh, planted here in 1897 all the way till uh, the Phantoms left in 2009. Uh, it's available in ebook and it's available in paperback, uh, wherever books are sold, your favorite online retailer, and directly from the publisher, uh, McFarland. And what else you got in store? Uh, any other ideas that you might want to uh, put pen to paper, proverbially? Certainly, there's always something everyone's thinking about. But uh, uh, that's the kind of that's kind of the fun of writing. You just you you mess around and you jot some stuff down, and 99% of it turns into nothing. And, and then at some point, that that little one percent pops out, and that's how you end up with a book like this. <laughs> any other any other forgotten sports stuff that uh, might be on your radar at some point? Uh, no but that's because it's forgotten. I haven't yet learned about it. Well, there you go. Uh, we just uh, did a, um, uh, an episode last week on uh, uh, a revisit of the uh, National Lacrosse League, the original one, uh, and the Philadelphia Wings. The, obviously, the current name uh, continues sort of the, somewhat of the legacy. We're certainly part of that. And Ed Tepper and the, and the Spectrum folks were, were part of that mixture as well. And that's a, a very interesting speed bump of history. And uh, we've also done a bunch. We we actually had um, uh, Ed Tepper on this show, as a matter of fact, uh, talking about the uh, founding of the uh, Major Indoor Soccer League, which the Spectrum was a uh, a component of, because uh, that's where uh, the then Philadelphia Adams played a couple of winter games, and the Russian national team came to play them, and and that's where he got the idea. Uh, Ed Tepper did to uh, to actually put his uh, dollars and his uh, head together with some other people to actually create a birth a sport that was kind of rattling around there. This is the indoor soccer thing in the late eighties, uh, seventies that uh, became a thing. Philadelphia being the center of that too. So I don't know. Philadelphia- and, and, in- and interestingly enough, not to interrupt you, but yeah. the major indoor soccer league, uh, Earl Foreman was a guy instrumental in creating that who was actually Ed Snyder's brother-in-law. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, uh, I, I, it's, I really wish we could have gotten to Ed uh, before his passing because uh uh, Mr. Foreman was uh, also part of the ABA's uh, start in Baltimore and all that kind of stuff. I, you know, but it's just very interesting how all these things sort of come together. Uh, but Philadelphia, the um, yeah, almost in many respects, a, a, a very solid cradle of uh, of sports um, uh, entrepreneurialism and uh, and pro sports uh, innovation. The fact that you're in the middle of it, I uh, you know, I got to think something will happen along the way. And when you do, uh, let us know, will you? Absolutely. (laughs) All right, there it is. Everything you wanted to know about professional hockey in Philadelphia and then some. Thank you to Alan. You can follow Alan's works at Alan Bass Writing, all one word, dot com. Bass is two S's. Alan Bass Writing dot com. You can follow uh, Alan on Twitter at Alan Bass Writing, all one word. And uh, what else? The book is called Professional Hockey in Philadelphia, A History. It's uh, published by our friends at McFarland, and uh, it is available wherever you can find good books. Uh, Of course, there will be a link to the book uh, on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. You will uh, be whisked away should you choose to click on that link. Uh, to our friends at Amazon, uh, where you will not only get likely the best price on the planet, uh, but depending if you're a Prime uh, a, a member, uh, you will uh, get it uh, shipped uh, almost immediately to your doorstep or wherever you want it sent. And uh, we'll get a couple of shekels uh, of love in the process and uh, help us keep our little uh, engine light on and um, uh, all the electricity and, and other stuff that's needed to get this uh this little show to you each and every week. It's uh, 
It's not a uh, it's not a charity. I'll tell you that. Sometimes it feels like it. However, but uh, I digress. If you want to follow us on social media, uh, you can do that too. You can find us on Twitter at Good Seats Still. Uh, you will find us on Facebook, and there is also an Instagram account devoted to us too. That is Good Seats Still available at Good Seats Still available. Uh, like I said, our website is GoodSeatsStillAvailable dot com. Uh, lots of uh, good stuff there, including every episode ever made for this show. If you've missed anything, if your feed has disappointed you or forgotten to record something or download something, it's all there for you. Uh, let's see. You can send us email, of course, at hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, when you do uh, that, uh, you can uh, also perhaps uh, before sending an email to us, why not uh, pay it forward by sending a, uh, a five star or, or thumbs up or hopefully a positive review wherever you can rate and review podcasts. Uh, I think Spotify is a good place to do that or Apple Podcasts, but, you know, just about anywhere, frankly, uh, you know, all the platforms that we're available on, I'm sure are going to start to have uh, ratings and reviews and recommendational engines and algorithms and stuff. And by uh, by doing that, that's probably the uh, least expensive way uh, that you can support the show by uh, giving us some uh, attaboys and uh, some nice descriptive uh, goodness, if you will, uh, in those ratings and reviews. And we, we appreciate that very much, of course. Uh, also, last thing, if you're on our website at goodseatsavailable.com, you'll be able to also find a button, a link to uh, get a uh, get included in our little weekly, uh, weekly. How about weekly? Yeah, that's it. Weekly newsletter. Uh, we will send that to you without uh, without despair. Uh, and uh, give you a little head start on what's going to be on uh, this uh, coming week's episode uh, for you to listen and enjoy. All right. We uh, I think we're done. No, we're not done. Of course, we want to say thank you to Jerry Payne. Of course, we're never done until we thank the great Jerry Payne down in Metro Atlanta. Thank you. Kind, sir, as always, for your editing goodness. Jerry Payne audio excellence. My goodness. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for listening next week. Fun filled excitement awaits you. I'm not going to tell you what it is, uh, but uh, I guarantee you'll enjoy it. And I hope you liked it this week, too. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week. Uh, Thanks again for listening. Bye. Bye.